and I'm going to just brush on hell now. Um, I don't want to dwell on it. Hell is a permanent, hopeless separation and exclusion from heaven and is an eternal torment. Some of you may understand eternal torment in terms of Dante's Inferno or a Rowan Atkinson sketch you once saw or something like that. Some of you may interpret eternal torment as annihilation. Some of you will interpret eternal torment as some sort of vindictive judgment. Yeah? There are different ways of looking at it. And if you read the Bible, and then you read commentaries on the Bible, you will see many different opinions on exactly what hell is. And there are various categories in which I could go into at another date. But for now, I will major on who goes there. <laughs> right? And I will use C.S. Lewis for this, because he puts it very, very well. In this world, we have something called choice. We have our will. And C.S. Lewis puts it this way, God will never send anybody to hell without their express permission. And he says it this way, those that will not bend the knee and say, your will be done, are those that say, that God will turn around to and say, then your will be done. In other words, those that don't like the idea of God those that don't want to be with God, those that have chosen to live their lives and say, do you know what? I'm going to be God for myself. I do not want you involved in my life. They are the ones that choose not to go to heaven because they've chosen they don't want to dwell with God. And it's fair enough. Those that choose to actually think, I cannot save myself. I need God. God to save me. I'm reliant for my very existence on him. I want to be with him so that I can live on. Those are the ones that God that say, thy will be done, Lord. And those are the ones that go to heaven. It's a very simple exchange of wills. And that is all that it is about when it comes to judgment day. And rather than go into it too much, I will leave it at that. So some of you, the 20% that don't believe in heaven, Some of you will say, well, what's the point in any of it? Why bother with heaven and hell? Why, why not believe in reincarnation? You know, I quite fancy the idea of coming back in another life as an insurance manager. Ooh. <laughs> um, you know, you might come back as a rabbit, and then you meet the one that came back as a dog, and they didn't like you in the previous life. <laughs> you know, um, what about this? Uh, let me give you an illustration, and I would argue, I would argue for any meaning in life at all, you need a few basic assumptions. One of the basic assumptions you need is that there is an eternity of existence in some way, shape, or form. Another basic assumption you need is that there is a definition of good and a definition of evil. Otherwise, whether you live like a Hitler or live like a Mother Teresa doesn't actually have any bearing on whether the life was meaningful or not. So you need a definition. And thirdly, you need a judge which distinguishes between good and evil and is the one that upholds that. Yeah? And I will argue it like this with a nice little illustration for you. Imagine for a moment there's a little boy sitting up in heaven somewhere. And he's a really fast typist. And he's tapping away on a laptop computer. No, ka-ting, because that's not there. You know, laptop. You know. Del Halo, you know, um, like that. And your life is being written down. What you said this morning to the kids, it's all on there, you know. What you did last week, the stuff you nicked from work. All right, that thing you said and that swear word you said under your breath and, and that prayer you prayed, which was really selfish and really good thing you did to Aunt Agatha. 
her like that, and you help that lady cross the road, and it's all going down, like this huge list, yours, my, my life, really fast typist, right? Everything we think, everything we say, in this huge list, right? If you don't believe in heaven and hell, if you don't believe in eternal life, and you don't believe in a definition between good and evil, then it's the equivalent of when this universe finally fails to, de- to be able to kind of sustain life, the laptop computer is shut down like that, the power goes from it, and nothing was saved. Does it matter what was written down? It doesn't. It may have been whatever. It it may have been three lines. It doesn't matter anymore because there is nobody to read it. There is nobody with eternal consequence in their lives. And there is no definition of whether what was written down matters or not in the first place, whether it was good or evil. So you need a standard of good or evil, somebody who reads it and upholds it, and also an eternal consequence to your life in order for any of it to have any meaning whatsoever. Without that, you have no meaning. So some people live with that knowledge. They think, this is it, 20%. Don't believe in heaven and hell. Therefore, I have to make up my own meaning, but ultimately it's meaningless because the whole thing is going to disappear. Revelation tells us that the whole thing will one day disappear. Science tells us that the whole thing one day will disappear. They're both telling you the same thing, so the laptop will one day be closed. If there is a God who is good and defines good and evil and upholds an eternal consequence of your life, then that laptop presses save and your life has meaning. If there is no God with no good and no eternal consequences to what you do, then the laptop is closed and there is no save button and everything is lost. Which means that if you believe in heaven, hell, and God, it matters whether you live like a Hugh Hefner, a Mother Teresa, or a Hitler. If you do not believe in eternal consequences, a definition of good and right and evil, and everything else, and you do not believe in a final judgment, then it doesn't matter what was lived. Fascinating. So judgment day matters immensely. Heaven matters immensely. Hell matters immensely. So what is hell? Hell is this separation theme. We read about in Revelation, I'm going to use the two terms that it uses, because the the metaphors we can get lost in, and we'll get lost in those in a whole sermon one day. The two metaphors it uses is the first death is the one you die here. The second death is the one you die when you go to hell. And so the first death is what we're familiar with. Um, so I've got Death to... isn't the way it should be. The Bible doesn't tell us that God in, invented death on purpose and intendedly, intentionally did the world this way so that death would occur. The Bible talks about how sin has resulted in death of mankind and that separation you feel and know is not the way it's supposed to be. And so the first death was not supposed to be. It wasn't the way God had planned it. The second death is not supposed to be, it wasn't the way God had planned it, but is a consequence of what has happened with the selfishness and the sinful nature that's gone on. Sin leads to suffering, sin leads to death. Death um, is a separation, and therefore, for those of us that know what that feels like, some of us, you you are separated from the person because you lost the person a long time ago before they died. And we know the pain of what that separation is. And hell is an example of the second death, which is an eternal separation. And I won't go into it too much because you can already feel the pain. Um, So it is a consequence of those that have willfully rejected God, that they are separated from God and without really intending it to be so because they think they can manage it for themselves. They are separated from the source of light, source of hope, source of love, source of peace, source of joy, source of, and all of these things. And this existence just gets ticked off. And the best way I can illustrate it, if I can, is heaven's like an infinitely large number and hell is like an infinitely small number without appearing to a zero. And it gives you an idea of what existence is like in one or other of those places.